Well, as a kid, I had a donkey engine, a little model steam engine. And my father used to take me to the live steam locomotive uh, track at West Ride. And uh, Dad was a mechanical engineer, and I was always helping him, and I got interested in little model steam trains. And by the time I was about 15, I'd heard about steam cars and traction engines. And these were big, friendly, warm, hissing things that were a lot of fun to play with. And I set out to get one, and I got my first Stanley about... Uh, 1975 now, I was only about 24, and it just went on from there. I always wanted a doable steam car, which is what we're in front of now, uh -huh. and uh, unfortunately there's a very rare, uh, only about 35 were ever built, about 1924. They're the Rolls-Royce of steam cars. And as the pressure drops, it will open the, open the fuel line and let more fuel in. And we're now going to go up to, say, 30, 35 mile an hour quite quickly. And up to 35 mile an hour. It's very important to see the cars because uh, every time we come out, like every two years, there's another one appears and then another one appears. And, oh, so-and-so, old uncle's got one or whatever. So it goes on from there and then we all help each other out. Uh, right through New South Wales, we've got, like, a network. Well, I don't really know about Australia, but... Uh, there were more steam cars in America than, than petrol cars right up to about 1905. And then the, uh, uh, the wheel started to run the other way. It turned in favour of the internal combustion car for various reasons. But until that time, the steam car was definitely superior. Oh, it, it's tasting the food, uh, the roads, uh, meeting people, meeting new, making new friends and uh, pushing our knowledge or putting our knowledge forward about these cars because they're so rare and it's a lot of fun. We meet some incredible people with some good stories. Oh, it's, uh, it's part of history, really. Um, I've never had any illusions about steam being a resurgent motive power for cars. It's uh, an interesting historical anachronism. It's just part of technology in a, uh, in a historical context. The future of cars will probably be electric, but uh, there's still a lot of fun in preserving uh, historical technology and keeping it exactly as it was. I'm not one for modifying it in any way if you can avoid it. So these cars work exactly as they once did. Now the original owner was the famous Howard Hughes. Now he bought two cars in 1925, two doubles. The first double he bought is in the Nethercott Museum, E20, and this one he bought in, later in the year in November, and this is E22. They're mechanically fascinating and it's like a puzzle, it's a, it's a delight just to work it out, uh, to keep them going, to um, sort out the problems, to have new parts made, uh, but the, a lot of the fun is meeting the people and sharing in the experience of driving them. Oh, they love this car, they love, especially, they're all commenting on the colour of the grey, they all like the grey, which took a lot of research, trying to get the grey right that matched the black, um, but Howard Hills had it grey and black in these colours and um, we tried to get it back how he had it. This little car, the English Mechanic, was the world's first do-it-yourself motor car. It was built in 1902 with local parts cast in London and a casting kit was sent out to Claremont in Queensland, built into a car which didn't work particularly well and the car ended up being scrapped. I was able to find the parts and I've since built the car using all the original parts and all the original drawings and plans. And if we hadn't done this and looked into this, where would they be as history gone? And these are history, and we can see a part of history, how they ran in the early 1900s, and here we are, 100 years later, running them just as they were. And that's the excitement again. <laughs>